Hello and welcome to this PIR live event, special for Hour of Code during Computer Science Education Week. We're brought to you by Partners in Research Canada. My name is Stacy Joyce and I will be your host. Don't forget you can ask questions throughout the webinar. You don't need to wait until the end. You can use that, the integrated chat function to do so and make sure you select everyone in the two fields so that all the students can see what questions are being asked. So without further ado, I would like to, um, actually I need to invite you to share with us if you're on Twitter. We would love to see uh, a picture of your class participating perhaps. You can use uh, hashtags for uh, hashtag Hour of Code, Canada Learning Code. If you're in Ontario, there's Ontario Codes or CS for All. Any and all of these are great this week. And if you have room to mention us, we're at Partners in Res. So today's guest is uh, Jean-Paul Amore, known as JP. He is a coordinator of game development, game design, and concept art for entertainment programs at George Brown College. Thanks so much for joining us. I will let you take it away. Hello to everyone, and thank you, Stacey. Um, so yes, today we're going to talk about uh, video game development, so video game programming is included in that. But uh, I wanted to give you uh, just a general overview of what uh, the video game industry looks like. Um, and uh, there's multiple different disciplines that come together and work together uh, to create a game. So uh, we'll explore that. But uh, before doing that, I just wanted to give you some background about myself. And yes, my background is in computer science and math. Uh, so I studied for quite a few years. And uh, actually, one thing that's really interesting about my studies is uh, what led me to become a, a programmer and study programming was uh, the love for video games. So as a kid, I, I played many video games, uh, not as advanced as they are today, but uh, nevertheless, uh, I was an avid gamer and uh, I really wanted to discover how to create those games. So uh, that led me to study computer science. And uh, once I finished, I did not end up in the game field, but I ended up in the web field. So. Uh, I started programming for web and then I started programming for software and uh, I came full circle just by coincidence and uh, got a job as a video game programmer in Toronto. Um, and uh, from there I started teaching video games and here we are today. Um, I still develop video games, uh, however, not to the capacity of a programmer, but uh, a producer and I will discuss what that is today. Uh, aside from video games, I also create apps, I create animations, uh, I've done music videos as well, so something that I never thought I would uh, do in my lifetime. But um, video games does bring together multiple different disciplines and uh, I think that's uh, a really, really uh, neat feature about the industry, uh, is that we are able to mingle with uh, different industries and different disciplines. Uh, to give you some stats about uh, game development in Canada and in Ontario. So over the years, I've seen many, many, many changes. And uh, I've been in video games now for about 17 years. So it's quite a long time. Uh, I've seen Canada grow exponentially. And uh, this is why we're the number two development country in the world. So that means that it's uh, one of the largest places where games are developed. And uh, we are the first in terms of producing games. One thing that uh, is really weird about Canada is most of the companies that are in Canada are not Canadian. So take, for example, a popular studio like Ubisoft. Uh, Ubisoft is a French company headquartered in Canada, which is weird. And uh, that also means that the games are technically uh, created in Canada, but they are French properties. So um, we're seeing a lot of foreign studios opening in Canada. And uh, I guess that that's really stimulating the economy. Uh, as you can see from the numbers, 2.3 billion in revenue generated from all of these Canadian companies that are developing games. So big number. Uh, one thing that I love to share with my students, of course, students studying uh, games, they want to know uh, what type of jobs are out there, how much am I going to make, um, what is uh, a future career looking like in games, how do I move up, that, that sort of thing. So 
uh, we're seeing that approximately the average salary is 73,000. And um, to create a game nowadays, uh, unfortunately, <clears throat> you can't cut it with one person. Uh, and I'm reminded of the 80s where one person would create a game. But nowadays, you need a big team. So roughly 65 is the average that's been accounted for. But I'd say that teams can go up to 150, 200 people just to create one game. Right. So uh, pretty big. Uh, for mobile, of course, that, that does change. Uh, they're much smaller games. So we're looking at an average of seven people that create uh, a mobile game. And uh, if we look at uh, people employed in Canada, so we're seeing a very big growth. 27,000 is the, the average uh, amount of employees that work in Canada today. But the projections are to be 50,000. Uh, within the next three years. So that's uh, almost doubling, which is uh, great for the industry. We're also seeing an increase in terms of the companies that are uh, uh, either opening in Canada or that are startups that are establishing themselves in Canada. So we see approximately 330 companies uh, Canada-wide. Um, some other stats that I wanted to share with you, and this is um, for those of you that are thinking of studying games, now uh, the average uh, game developer's age is 31, and that's decreasing uh, very rapidly. Uh, that's due to the, I guess, uh, when people studied and then, of course, uh, went into the industry. The age group uh, was a bit older, but now that's decreasing. Uh, and uh, in Ontario, uh, we do have quite a few companies as well. So. Uh, the, the recorded stats say an average of 96, but I know for a fact that that's increasing. Um, and so is the number of female to, ratio, uh, female to male ratio of game developers. So um, I'm reminded of uh, 17 years ago when I started, we were looking at probably 1 to 99% male. And uh, it's encouraging to see that uh, females are interested in developing games. So, uh, it's almost a 50-50 split, which is great. Now, if we look at the different areas um, of game development, so there are quite a few. I narrowed it down to four, and uh, this is based on departments in a game studio. So uh, we have game artists and uh, game programmers. Those are the two groups of people that create the game, uh, while we have game designers that conceptualize the game and game producers that sort of manage uh, the development of and the process of, the, of developing games. Um, so just to give you some, uh, some more information about each area, um, game designers, as I said, are creative people. They like to conceptualize and then uh, see their concept become a game. So uh, what they do is they spend a lot of time on paper. They spend a lot of time playing out scenarios for games, and then they formalize it into something known as a game design document. So this is known as um, the Bible for developing games. And uh, from there, that Bible is given out to both game artists and game programmers. Um, think of it as a blueprint for how to create the game. So essentially, game artists and game programmers will gather the information from the one document and they'll know what to work on uh, based on the specifications outline. Um, different careers that game designers can pursue. Uh, creative director, which would be the head of the studio that uh, is in charge of the entire design for all the game properties. A game designer is in charge of one game, and uh, they're responsible for coming up with game mechanics. So essentially, how does it work if I press the left button, does the character move left, or does it do something else? And finally, we have level designers, and they're in charge of um, sort of the urban planning of a game. So if you were to think of games like Splinter Cell that are set in a city, a level designer is responsible for laying out that city and making it fun, which is the most important thing. Producers, on the other hand, are more of the businessy type. So um, they project manage, they ensure that uh, the project is up to budget. Uh, they make sure that they have enough developers to work on the game. 
but at the same time, they can influence the design and the art and programming um, just by budgets or by timelines not being met. So uh, it's, a, it's a very um, intense job in the sense that it requires a lot of responsibility. Game artists are, uh, of course, creating the visuals. So I give you a few samples of visuals that you might see. Uh, and actually, there's quite a few different types of artists. So uh, for the larger games, uh, it's very common to have concept artists that do a lot of research before the actual production of a game starts. And uh, what they're doing is they're researching costumes, uh, uh, different character profiles, how do the characters move or work in the game. Uh, and from there, all of the concept art is given to game modelers, uh, which will create a 3D representation of the concept art. And that 3D representation is what will go into the game. Um, 3D models are typically static uh, visuals. So to bring it to life, uh, we need the assistance of game riggers and game animators. And what these two groups of people do is one creates the skeleton for the character. And uh, you can see a little image of a skeleton right over here. Um, and then the animator creates the motion for that character. So the combination of the two will bring characters to life. And then finally, our game programmers uh, take all of that art and turn it into reality. So uh, they're the ones that put it into a game. They make it move. They control it. Um, they make sure that all of the functionality, all of the mechanics that were outlined in the game design document work according to specification. And hopefully, finally, you have a game. Uh, now you can see different roles. Um, I sort of subdivided uh, programmers into a technical director, which oversees all of the games that the studio creates. So they're really in charge of uh, ensuring that the games are being released in the most sustainable way. While game programmers they have many different duties. And uh, to break it down, I gave you some job um, titles that you could see at a game studio. So uh, the most common one and the one that I usually advise students to pursue as soon as they graduate is a junior programmer. But uh, you'll see that as you get promoted in a game studio, uh, there are many different types of uh, positions, and they really specialize uh, so, for example, an engine programmer has a very, very, very different programming job than a networking programmer. That's just to give you an example, but um, uh, graphic programmers, of course, uh, work on having the visuals function properly with the game engine. Physics programmers work on having physics work. Uh, AI programmers work on artificial intelligence, etc. Uh, I guess two interesting ones that you might not be familiar with are tools programmers. So it's very common for a game studio to create tools to assist them in speeding up the process of developing games. So a tools programmer won't necessarily work on a game per se, but they'll work on tools that could carry across multiple games that the studio is creating. And a porting programmer is responsible for ensuring that it works across multiple platforms. So for example, a game might be intended for an Xbox initially, but then the studio might decide that they want to have it also for a PS4. So that porting programmer will transition the game from an Xbox to um, a PlayStation. And can I just pause you there, JP, on, on your previous slide? Sure. I'm just wondering if you could give an example of what one of those tools would look like. What tools sure, could a tool programmer create that would span and, and actually, I am going to switch to the next slide because uh, okay. one of the engines that I have listed is Unreal Engine 4. And that's a, a freely downloadable engine. So you can definitely download it at home and check it out. But uh, to answer the tools question, so Unreal has a lot of tools that are built in. One of those tools is, for example, a level editor. So that allows you to construct a level just by dragging 3D assets onto a scene. And essentially, through this tool, you can create a city, for example. So that tool 
will facilitate the job of level design and programmers work on that tool in order to uh, speed up the level design process. So I'm not sure if that answers the question, but uh, that's... Yeah, no, I think so, yes. Perfect. Um, so other game engines that are very common uh, today is Unity. Uh, Unity and Unreal are sort of the standards, and then you can see the uh, other engines, but they're not as popular. To give you an example, CryEngine is another engine that's available. Uh, but it's not adopted by most studios just strictly because of um, the, the functionality. It's not as complementary and um, um, speedy as uh, the other two engines that I listed. Uh, both uh, Unity and Unreal are available for free, so you can download them. Uh, these are engines that you would find um, um, taught at any institution. Uh, for example, at George Brown College, we do teach uh, both engines and how to use them, how to program for them. Um, from students, I typically get questions um, uh, aligned more towards what programming languages should they study. So I thought it would be interesting for you to uh, see, and I know that these are taught in high school. C and C++ are very common languages. Um, I studied it while I was in high school, and uh, sure enough, I used it when developing games. Uh, they are still the standard today. C Sharp is probably one of the more recent programming languages, and I listed that because uh, if you wanted to pursue Unity, uh, C Sharp would be the standard. Uh, and finally, Java is another common programming language. Not as common uh, as the other two, but nevertheless still used to create Android games, so for mobile. Um, but I'd say the three of these languages are definitely the de facto standard, and um, I would encourage you to uh, look into them more, especially if you're pursuing the game programming. Now, um, I do want to show you, and I do want to answer questions, but I'm going to show you uh, some uh, programming tips, but prior to that, if you're interested in getting into games, I also listed some opportunities uh, for you, and this uh, I typically share with our college students, but it definitely applies to high school and uh, prior to high school. So if you're interested in getting into games, I would encourage you to take a look at the International Game Developers Association, or IGDA for short. And uh, they're an international organization, but they do have chapters in cities across the world. So Toronto does have a, a chapter, and they do hold uh, monthly events, typically, where they bring in developers from all across the world. Um, so you can listen to speeches, you can uh, ask questions, very similar to what we're doing right now, uh, except you get to meet them in person. <laughs> but uh, aside from IGDA, Hand-Eye Society is another organization. This one's Toronto-specific, but uh, what they do is they bring together the indie development community that we have in Toronto. So these are smaller sized companies that develop probably less popular games. So uh, to give you an example, um, I'd say Mega Run is uh, an indie game that became popular on uh, iPhones, and that's developed by Get Set Game, which is uh, a Toronto company. But uh, Hand Eye Society does have regular meetings as well, similar to IGDA. But I encourage you once again to go to their website and um, check, um, check out the dates that they're offering. Toe Jam is a very interesting event. Uh, this one is typically offered around uh, May. And it's a 72-hour event where game developers get together to develop games uh, within that time frame. So, um, all developers are under extreme pressure. They, they uh, have to come up and brainstorm game ideas very quickly and then develop them within that 72-hour period. Uh, lots of fun. Uh, I've seen tons of games developed during that 72-hour period that then became commercial games. So very, very interesting. Um, for colleges, uh, we do have an Ontario-based event. So all colleges get together at Level Up, and that's uh, roughly around April. Uh, and they showcase what they develop throughout the school year. So if you're interested in any of the institutions in Ontario, 
you can uh, definitely check out Level Up in uh, April. Uh, what I would do is suggest uh, just Google searching Level Up Ontario and you'll be able to uh, get to our website and uh, preview the next date for uh, the event. Uh, finally, uh, the Game Developers Conference. This is in San Francisco, so I'm not sure if uh, everyone can attend, but if you do have the opportunity to attend, this is um, the biggest gaming event that you will see in the year. It's the Game Developers Conference, so you'll have developers from all across the world coming together to talk about their experiences developing games. <coughs> so a very interesting um, event to participate in. Uh, now, IGDA does offer scholarships for students to attend the event for free. Uh, typically, the event is very expensive. Uh, for example, for myself, it would roughly cost around three to four thousand dollars for tickets and flights, accommodations, etc. So, uh, free is not bad. Uh, I'd encourage everybody to uh, definitely take a look at uh, all of these different events or organizations that are in the game community. Um, would it be a good time to answer any questions, Stacey? Sure, I think um, we can pause right now. Um, I have, uh, let's see, where should we start? You mentioned that we're almost 50-50 now for men and women in the industry, That's which great. is yeah. wonderful. Um, Mr. Legate's class in Markdale, Ontario, wanted to know if there's any disparity in the earnings of men in the industry versus women, if you could and that's an interesting question. Uh, published stats say there is, but that's also because the stats that were published saw a much lesser percentage of females working in a game studio. So if on average you have a majority of females that are junior positions, uh, it will equate to a lower salary. But um, in the industry as a whole, no. I mean, it's, uh, it's typically based on position, not based on gender which is great and the way it should be. So you're seeing salaries that will definitely match across gender. So it will be interesting to see as many of those women who have brought up the stats of how many women are involved. They might be junior programmers right now, and, and I bet those salaries, we can hope, will that disparity might go away over time. That's right. Um, so we also have a question from Ms. Willis's grade sevens. Um, they're at Lawfield School in Hamilton, Ontario. They would like to know what games have you made personally? Anything they've heard of? Uh, well, I did actually list one of the games. I, I know I didn't mention it, but uh, here's an image of one of the games that I worked on. This was actually my first virtual reality game called Stringer. And um, uh, you can find footage online. This game was a serious game. So it's not a game that you would purchase, let's say, at an EB Games. It's um, a tool to assist journalists that are going into war scenarios. So it's a training game, essentially. And something that's really interesting is, since it's VR, it uses an Oculus Rift. And uh, I'm sure some of you will receive that for Christmas. but. Uh, uh, what it allows you to do is fully immerse in the game. So in other words, you're not able to see a screen or anything. You just see the game and uh, the environment and the situations that are given to you. Very neat. Going back to women in the industry, uh, Mr. Birdie's, or sorry, Mr. Brighty's class would like to know, um, in your opinion, are women treated any differently in the gaming industry? No, I don't think so. Actually, um, if we were to say differently, I'd say that they're favored. We're encouraging that women come to studios, apply to studios, and uh, we're definitely trying to increase that uh, uh, female population. One thing I will note is, uh, unfortunately, stereotypes still exist, so you will see that a lot of females are interested much more in the arts, while a lot of males are interested a lot more in the programming, and I guess that's just due to historical um, uh, patterns that we've seen, but those numbers are changing. So, and I'm seeing that in the student body uh, here at George Brown. Very nice. And um, in Bragg Creek, Alberta, they're wondering how long does it take to make a game from start oh, to finish? That's a good question. And I get that question all the time from students that uh, I have. Uh, now, I'd actually like to differentiate between mobile games and console games. So, 
Typically, mobile games are uh, a lot quicker to develop. Uh, yet, at the same time, they take a lot longer to develop. So that's kind of a contradiction. Um, a game from its conception to its release, if it's a mobile game, should take, roughly speaking, three to six months. But at the same time, if you really think about it, a mobile game evolves as the players play. So uh, let's take Angry Birds as an example. They're still developing Angry Birds, yet it's changed a lot since it was first released in 2009. So uh, mobile games go through cycles, but to develop one cycle will take a lot less than a console game, which could take, roughly speaking, two to four years to develop. Awesome. Um, we've got a question here from Mr. Isowa's class. I hope I said that right. Um, are there any programming languages that can take advantage of 3D TV and headset units? Yeah, absolutely. So um, 3D TV isn't explored as much as uh, the other technologies. It's not as popular, I'd say, but um, technologies that I would uh, recommend would be definitely HTML5 has uh, becoming more emergent on those platforms. Uh, so it's, it's not yet an industry standard, but it is being used to develop uh, for 3D TVs. Um, Flash used to be one of the technologies, but unfortunately it seems that it hasn't gained that much momentum on 3D TVs. So I'd recommend HTML5. Awesome. And from Regent Heights in Toronto, Ms. Chang's class would like to know what sparked your interest in game design? Oh, that's interesting. Uh, well, as I said, as a kid, I played games nonstop. Um, and uh, I'd say what really captivated me about developing games and designing them was deconstructing them. So as a, as a kid, I did not have uh, any of the traditional consoles that exist nowadays. I had a Commodore 64, which some of you might have heard, um, but it, it was sort of a game console, sort of a computer, uh, a bit in the middle. It allowed a player to really spark my interest in programming, and ultimately that's how I ended up here. So I've got a few quick questions for you. Um, in, I'm just trying to look for the name here. We've got a a question about um, what your favorite game is from Mr. Uh, Party's class again. Um, so I get that question from students all the time, and I have to say Street Fighter 2 is one of them. Um, <laughs> Bubble Bobble is another one. That's the many days that I spent in the arcades, uh, unfortunately, which don't exist nowadays, but uh, uh, definitely take a look at Bubble Bobble, Street Fighter 2. I'm a little sister, so I know all about watching Street Fighter 2. That's perhaps setting our ages in a particular place. Um, and another quick one, I guess for your preference, Mr. Weisinger's class would like to know, Nintendo, Sony, or Xbox? Uh, difficult question. Um, I'd have to say Nintendo for its innovation. Um, even though we're starting to see innovation from the other two, so my answer might change next year. I, um, I do have one more general question I'd like to ask, just in case any of our viewers need to, uh, need to move on to other things today. We're getting towards the end of our posted time. Um, and then maybe for those who can stay, we'd be able to show that, uh, that module we were talking about. So um, what are the most important skills we should work on in elementary school middle school if the students are interested in a career in video gaming. That's coming from Mr. McCleary's class in Burford, Ontario. Right. Okay. So I would say, I, I would suggest definitely figuring out what really interests you about game development. So whether it's the arts or the programming. Once uh, you've established that, then uh, if it's art, do lots of art. So drawing, uh, photography, uh, digital art on the computer, all musts that uh, I would encourage you to do. While if you're interested in the game programming side, uh, logic is probably the most important thing. So actually, the module that we're about to see is perfect to introduce you to uh, uh, game programming. Excellent. 
And uh, last little question before we start on that. Um, Mr. Legate's class want to know if you, when you're programming, do you work on a Windows, a Mac, or a Linux platform? And um, I find that a lot of students are used to Windows as, as their platform of choice. Now, my philosophy is that um, to me it's not important which platform. Uh, you should be well versed in all platforms. Um, I can answer the question by saying that I do own a Mac that has Windows installed on it. So at least I'm able to develop for both environments and I sometimes have to develop in both environments. Uh, to give you an example, to publish for an iPhone, you would have to create the entire game in an OSX framework. But to create, let's say, a PC game, you would need Windows. So I, I find that I switch a lot between platforms. That makes sense. Well, I think we should uh, pause questions for a little while. If anyone else has any more questions, keep them coming. I'll sort of put them in queue. And for now, let's have a look at the very basics of coding and, and what that looks like with the, the logic, et cetera. I know we're not talking programming languages here. Is it Blockly that we're using? That's okay. right. And sorry, I'm just trying to share my uh, window. Yep. <clears throat> There we go. I can see your web browser now. Perfect. So um, one of the um, code.org uh, examples that I really found neat and relatable was the Angry Birds one. So once you land on this page and uh, you just scroll down a bit, you will see that there's an Angry Birds uh, icon. Now, I already have that open, so you should be able to see this game. Um, I and what's more interesting than playing a game and learning how to program at the same time, right? So uh, one thing that, um, uh, one rule that I guess you should follow when programming is programming is very step by step. Now, it's, it's very easy for um, new beginners to uh, get locked into the programming language. How, how do I issue this command or how do I do this? Um, but what's more important than understanding the programming language itself is the logic behind how to program. So um, as I was saying, it's very linear. For example, we want to have this bird reach this destination. And to do that, to, to guide the bird, we have to give the bird instructions. So for example, when run, move forward. If I run this, it's going to move once. But I didn't achieve the goal that I was set out to. So you'll notice that we have another move forward block. And if I just reset that and run it again, I completed the, the objective. So essentially programming is telling the computer step by step what to do. Now in our case, I said computer, but in our case it was the character. Uh, when you're programming, that's exactly what you would do. You would issue commands step by step to tell the computer what to do. And I will continue over here by another example. Okay, so this one is move forward, move forward, move forward, because we're going to move three spaces. And I reached my objective. Now, what about if we want to issue other commands? So, uh, in this case, we have three different sets of uh, commands or blocks. And we want to move our bird forward two spaces and turn, then one more space. So let's see if this works. I'm going to turn to the right and I'm move forward again. Perfect. <laughs> 
Can we maybe skip ahead to um, a more complicated example? Or there? This definitely looks more complex. Let's see. So this does not look like Angry Birds. It's plants versus zombies. And I'm assuming that we need to get the zombie up here. So let's see, probably move forward. And we'll move forward maybe twice. And then perhaps we'll turn left, move forward again. Okay, let's see what this says. Okay, so I probably moved too many steps. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to edit the blocks that I had Disconnect these, I'm going to trash them, reset it, and let's try to move forward, turn, and that seemed to work. So uh, I think it's missing one step, which is to move to the right. And aside from that, we want to be able to repeat it because we're going to reach the end. So I'm going to move this repeat until, so repeat until, Turn left, move forward, turn right, uh, and move forward. So we'll repeat this over and over again until it reaches the sunflower. Let's see what this does. Oh, I think one of my blocks moved out of place. I'm just going to fix it. Okay, so. Move forward, turn left, move forward, turn right. Let's try that out. And it looks like we're going to reach our destination. Perfect. And a little zombie audio action there for your trouble. <laughs> so how does that compare to your application of coding? And maybe now would be a good time that we could stop sharing the screen and then we can see you a little bit larger on the screen there. Perfect. Um, how does it compare? Uh, it's actually the exact way that I would program or at least think about programming. Uh, so everything has to be step by step. You really have to Think through what you're going to do before you do it. And then, of course, you test it out. So as we did uh, with our little code block over there. Awesome. Um, maybe you could touch on the skills that are involved in coding. So for, for someone who maybe doesn't want to go do game design or doesn't want to do web design, doesn't want to do a career that focuses on coding, what benefits would they get from learning some basic coding or having some, some literacy in that area? Sure, I, I would say that a lot of different things are um, turning towards code um, in much more layman terms, if that makes sense. So we're starting to see a lot of products that require some sort of programming. Uh, I'll give you an example, home automation does require a very, very, very little bit of knowledge of how to program, but it doesn't require you to program per se. So I think it's becoming a modern day language and it's something that should be studied because it will apply to many different things, not just to developing things. And do you have any advice for how students might achieve that? How might they do that introductory level of study? What courses or subject areas would they pursue? Absolutely. So um, whether you're in uh, elementary school, in middle school, or in high school, I definitely recommend taking as many computer technology courses as possible. Uh, back when I was in high school, it was the computer science series of courses, and I can tell you I took all of them since uh, middle school. So uh, that greatly um, assisted me when I started university. Uh, in terms of learning programming. I already knew programming, so that's my advice to all of you. 
Awesome. And just before we, we sign off today, we had a question to recap those two tools that you mentioned. So I know you, Unity was one of them. What was the Unity other one? One of them and Unreal Engine 4 is the second one. So what I will do, I can let our viewers know, I will post those in the follow-up email. If you're watching this on YouTube as a recording, it will be in the description below for where you can find those tools, continue your, your, your learning and, uh, and play a little on your own after this. So that is all the time we have today. Thank you so much to everyone who tuned in and thank you especially to JP for sharing your expertise with us today. Thank you. And uh, just to let you know, next week on PIR Live event, we are learning about careers in medicine and medical research. So more information on this and upcoming webinars is available at PIRweb.org. Thanks again, everyone, and have a great day.